welcome everyone. Thank, thank you all for coming. Uh, and also, thank you all for supporting the museum. Most of you, those of you who aren't um, either friends of mine or friends of the Wilsons or staff members, are, are upper, upper level members. And we thank you very much for your generous support and dedication to the museum. Um, also want to thank our good friend Michael Wilson and Jane Wilson, uh, his wife, who's here in the front row, and you'll be able to talk to both of them at the reception afterwards. Um, I was going to dispense with long introductions. We have a lot to cover this evening, because um, we have a, a person who's both a, a great collector as, as, as well as a photographer himself. Um, and so uh, I suggest you, you can read read some of what's written here. I did just find out a little, a couple hours ago, there's a mistake here. Uh, Michael is not uh, an in, in, uh, uh, officer of the British Empire. He has been promoted to commander of the British Empire. Yeah. Yeah, my old job. So, uh, but, um, I think you, 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 will, you will find in this that uh, uh, you'll find a lot of information about uh, Michael's incredible accomplishments as a, as a film producer, as a screenwriter, um, and the many honors he's received. Mm -hmm. But something this, this doesn't really adequately indicate is the long relationship that he and Jane have had this with this museum for, for decades and, and how this museum has benefited from that. Um, Michael's sort of second parallel career as a photography expert and as a eminent, with Jane, eminent <laughs> pho photograph collector um, is, um, is um, to some degree entwined with the history of this museum and I think you'll see as, as we go on, the museum to some degree evolved uh, with Michael and Jane's uh, collecting interests. So with that, Michael, um, I thought with your permission, I'd like to start right from the beginning. Okay. Um, how you, how you be, became a collector? Did you start out with baseball cards and <laughs> graduate to something more uh, extravagant? Or were your parents collectors? I think you early on you were very interested in books, yes? Yeah, I, I started out as a book collector, and I started out with first editions as a young, just really when I got out of college. And then I sort of tired that pretty quickly and got into um, historical books and incunabula books, which are the ones that are printed before 1500. So if you think of the first book with movable type would have been printed around uh, 1455, the Gutenberg Bible, then uh, there were um, um, about 30,000 different separate editions that were published uh, between that and 1500. And that, um, so there's a lot of areas to, to cover and I, I put together a small collection. It was, uh, I was intrigued by it. And um, then I, I started, um, um, we moved to New York, Jay and I, and we were, uh, it was about in the um, late 60s, early 1970s, and uh, we ran into Weston F. there, who was uh, uh, a classmate of ours at the Claremont Colleges, and he'd just uh, become the uh, curator of uh, prints and drawings at the Metropolitan Museum. And um, we, that uh, friendship started up, and for that, for almost uh, 10 years, um, you know, I'd see Weston and his fascination with photography, but at the same time, I had moved on to prints and drawings as a collector. And uh, since he was also in the uh, uh, prints, drawings, and photographs department at the Met, it was an opportunity to get to know people. And um, one of the great uh, characters that he introduced me to was Lucien Goldschmidt. And it was uh, Lucian Goldsmith was a book dealer in uh, New York, but he he was interested in photography as well, and he was a he was a mentor to a lot of people. 
Yeah, just Michael, if I may interrupt just a, a couple of things. One thing that uh, uh, you should know, some of, some of you know this, Michael and Jane and, and actually Michael's parents, I don't know if you can read it, Michael's chair may be blocking it, Albert and Dana Broccoli, uh, collected uh, Daumier, Honoré Daumier lithographs and other uh, 19th century French uh, satir satirical prints, um, some and gave some 3,500 of them to this museum, <laughs> so that this museum is really one of the great repositories in the country of that material. Um, and I was curious, Michael, how, how did you get into the to the those that area of collecting? Well, yeah, you know, we were living in Europe and working in and uh, living in London and working in. Um, working in Paris and around Paris over the years. And, and uh, I started collecting these lithographs over on the left bank, if you know the area that where all the prints and, and book dealers were at, in those days. And, um, and, and then um, when I was in New York, I met Lucien, and uh, Wes had introduced me to him. And he, um, he said, oh, he, has a, he had a collection that, he was, that could be for sale, and maybe I'd buy it. it was, too much for me to handle, but I did get my parents interested in purchasing mm -hmm. something as, as well. So we bought a large collection and then supplemented through auctions and buying uh, along, you know, in, in Paris when we were there. So we built a nice collection over the years. Well, the Im images you see are a couple of the humorous ones, typical Daumier with something taking place in a gallery. This gentleman doesn't like the comments that the visitors are making about his portrait. Um, and then here, it's kind of Daumier's uh, update, sort of 19th century uh, bourgeois take on uh, the figures of, uh, of Ulysses and Penelope. Um, remember, Ulysses was came back from, uh, from, if you remember the Odyssey, came back from the Trojan Wars to Penelope, who had been spurning uh, suitors for some time. But you can see maybe, yeah, may, maybe it was, having him back wasn't quite so thrilling as she imagined <laughs> to be. Well, but, he'd been away 20 years. What the hell but, 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 I, but I did wonder, a lot of these prints tend to be uh, political in nature. So I was just curious whether you and Jane may have been politically active in those years, and well, maybe that was part of it. I was a lawyer most of the time, and was uh, I was just keeping my nose down and work. Mm. But uh, pretty soon I switched over in the film business, about in the middle of the '70s, and um, and I suppose uh, got more interested in what was going around. But um, I, I think the important thing is the influence of of uh, of um, Lucian Goldschmidt on us because. Uh, Weston and he did a did a um, they did a book uh, really Weston's first book Weston ultimately came here and set up the department of photographs at the Getty in 1984 85 and he w he established that department but his first um, when he was in New York he wrote a book with Lucian Goldsmith uh, called the Era of Exploration which is a major book on the history of photography and they were joint uh, and then uh, Anthony Dauphay, who is, uh, who is a friend of ours in London, who's uh, you know, one of the big dealers of contemporary art and everything, when I mentioned this in an audience like this, when I was saying how much uh, when we were in London, he's popped up and said, God, he was my mentor too. So apparently there are a lot of people around who Lucian was really responsible for helping to start their interest in, in and I, you know, I wonder uh, who these people are today. I just don't know who they are, you know. Yeah, you know, I mean, we talked about that. I'm, I'm just not sure there are many of them out there, these sort of dealer scholars um, who are so knowledgeable and you could learn things from them that you, you simply can't learn from books, but it, it comes from their long uh, acquaintance with the actual objects. And, and he kind of understood who to put things with. He knew who would be good, People to keep the keep the material together and keep it uh, and add to it and and be and learn from it and then, as we did ultimately here, uh, when when I decided to go on totally into photography, I was interested in dealing with the uh, collections and so uh, the um, you know being uh, uh, um, 
being up, uh, this, this museum is very focused on 19th century French art and had been at the time. So it seemed like a, naturally, a natural home for it. And of course, they wanted to do the uh, charged image, which was the show that was put on when the Broccoli's and myself donated this, this collection here. Yeah, that was, that was back in 1989. Mm -hmm. Well, aside from giving this museum all those Domi prints, you also gave us quite a few Felician Ropes prints, um, I think more than 50, some of which are up in Ike Conger, Deputy Director's fascinating mm -hmm. exhibition, Iconography of Dread, that's upstairs that you could see. But you, you gave us 50 of these, and I was wondering, was it, was it Lucien who got you interested in Ropes? Because he was Belgian himself. Yes, he was, Bel he was Belgian. And, I, and again, I bought a large collection from him and then supplemented it. But that was, you know, Jane and I bought that collection. And, uh, and we, um, initially, I gave, it, I gave part of the collection to um, the um, uh, LACMA. <laughs> to Lava, um, and um, and unfortunately they were they did little with it and told me they wouldn't show it to people. But in the meantime, over the years they've uh, lacked, relaxed their um, their concerns and they have been uh, showing it a little bit. But um, yeah, you, you you can tell a little bit from the images. We have many of these ropes prints are fairly erotic. Um, some of them deal with difficult subjects having to do with uh, mortality. And um, I think maybe they were just a little too intense, maybe, yeah, for... Mortality, but also erotic, or maybe more than just erotic. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, that... Uh, well, but well, so so, but then, so then you 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 turn your attention to photography. Now, was Lucian Goldschmidt was, was did he help? No. Uh, well, he was, was, that, was he was Weston? a photographic collector, but I had moved down to New York and really didn't have much more contact with him. I got involved with the photographic group here, and and uh, you know, uh, uh, seeing the Burns here reminded me of their of her parents and and. Uh, the, the great community we had of all the collectors were here and the, and the dealers in the early days that were just really starting to re, re uh, d find, you know, there was a, in the, after the first, during and after the First World War, there was a fairly active photographic collecting and then it died out. And then it started up again, uh, I think, uh, in the uh, 70s here, in the in the 80s, and uh, and a lot of us were, uh, you know, just getting into it and discovering things about it and learning about the art history, which still had yet to be written. Do, do you recall what were some of the first photographs that you acquired? Well, I know that the uh, first one I acquired in a in a gallery was a uh, um, the was um, one of Annie Brigman's. Oh, interesting. Uh, which uh, I bought in New York, oddly enough, although she's a California photographer. <laughs> um, but the um, uh, 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 Henning uh, was, um, you know, the uh, Robert curator, Henning, was former a curator here, chief curator here, mm -hmm. and and he, when he got the, you know, I I um, we discussed the charge image with him, and he wanted to do the show. But he saw I was collecting photography, so he said, look, why don't we, um, you know, photography used to be very, um, uh, we were cutting edge back in the 60s, and it seems that we've lost, uh, the museum has lost its, you know, interest in photography, but it's something we could start up again. How do you feel about coming on the board and, and supporting us? And so, uh, I, you know, I said to him, well, um, if we're going to do something, we have to put a stake in the, in the ground and, and make a point that we're getting back in the business again. And I said, we have to also have an active program, which means that every, you know, every couple of years, we've got to have a traveling show, just not a show, but a traveling show that means something in art history. And we have a catalog that puts another brick in the wall of art history. And that's the way we've got to approach it. And he was all for that. 
And so I came on the board and was the sort of sp spokesman for that. I, I want to get to some of those shows that you were sort of the driving yeah. force behind. But first, I wanted to, to bring up this because I know <laughs> some of you saw this. Charlie had, had these up in a recent show about uh, uh, visions of antiquity, photographs of antiquity, mm -hmm. although these are, are actually uh, some of the uh, architectural elements in the uh, Paris Opera House. Um, but there's a, I know there's a little story that goes with these, Michael, yeah? Well, we were, yeah, it was, uh, it was went down and uh, we were working down in um, Mexico City in the late 80s. And, um, and so while we're there, we lived there for a year. Jane set up house there and we, were, we had our son down there, Greg, who was going to school and was, uh, and you know, it was uh, Cherubusco Studios and working away. And so on the weekends, I, I, you know, we always try to do something. And I, so I would uh, sometimes prowl the, um, the junk shops and things like that. And one day uh, I was, um, I, 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 and I had a translator with me. So I went down there and you know, I'd have someone there to negotiate if I, and um, there was a guy that had a lot of things, and he wanted. And his big collection was Coca-Cola stuff, which I wasn't particularly interested in. But he, he did have in the basement some photographs. So I went down there and looked through it, and it wasn't really. I was somewhat disappointed. And I'm coming up the stairs. It's sort of dim, and the door is propped open by something. I trip over. So I look down <laughs> at it, and it's uh, the Durandell portfolio uh, of 40. I think it's 49 or. 47 uh, photographs, and these are photographs that during the building of the Paris Opera, uh, he photographed pieces uh, um, as they came uh, to the work yard, uh, and he photographed them while they're on the ground, and then they would go up and, and be interior and exterior elements. And it's uh, regarded as sort of an interesting uh, piece of art history, and also, a, a bit of early surrealism uh, that uh, by art art historians, and it's a you know it's a these were selling in those days for almost a thousand dollars a print or maybe sometimes oh more. Goodness. So um, so I saw that and I picked it up and said, well, I, so I said, gee, I want to buy this, and they said, well, the woman said, be careful because this guy is uh, he buys old estates and stuff, and he's really you know he's a real shark. So I said, well, uh, ask him how much he wants. The guy says $500. I said, tell him I'll buy it. She said, no, because he'll, he'll know something's wrong. Let me negotiate. <laughs> so she ends up getting it for $250. So, so I said, you know, I, I can't. This is such a great deal. It really has to, I, I can't in good conscience keep it. I got to give it to the museum. So. Uh, as soon as we got back, Jane and I came up here and donated it to the museum. That's how they got. Well, thank you for that. But so we got a, we got a forty-seven thousand dollar doorstop for two hundred and fifty bucks, right? And you didn't even pay that. And we and you didn't even pay that. Okay. Um, actually, before we get too far, um, the Wilson Center for Photography in London, you and Jane established yep. in 1998, is that right? Yeah, I think so, something and, like and, that. And um, which is one of the great private collections of photography in the world. Um, what, what, was, what, what caused you to do that? What, what, what were your goals in establishing that? Well, I think that, um, you know, we were, um, in a way, um, collecting quite actively, and um, I, I had a, um, a curator we brought over from uh, Violet Hamilton had been in uh, working here at in the university at uh, downtown Los Angeles at uh, uh, USC, and and um, I hired her, and she. Um, came with us to California, and, and we had been working on, with Karen Sinsheimer. It, the thing was that when, when uh, we decided to start up the photographic group here, uh, they, they hired, uh, the museum hired Karen Sinsheimer, who was not a great, uh, was not known as a great scholar, but she was a go-getter like you can't believe, you know, and, and she would manage to 
put people in situations together, raise money, and do everything you needed. So she was perfect for the for the job, and um, and we would bring in external curators to do the shows. So, and I had my own curator, and then we were. Uh, I realized that I was getting it was getting more than one person could handle, and and we were uh, trying to. We need a space, so we bought the ground floor of the building next to us so that we could put the collection there, and that's how it started. Yeah. And, and although I say it's one, we don't know for sure if it's the greatest collection of uh, private collection of photographs, but but certainly I think of the early historical material, it, well, it probably is. It's the very best hard collection. to say these things because there are, um, you know, um, there are collectors have enormous collections of photographs that are almost un, you know, more than you can deal with. But I think as far as us selecting, I mean, we try to select uh, good examples from the whole history of photography, try to put together shows, collect around, you know, shows and things like that. So it's a, um, a fairly focused collection of uh, early uh, and, and um, Pictorialism, early 20th, 19th century pictorialism and modernism uh, photographs. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, um, you um, were, as we started to say a, a couple of minutes ago, you were responsible for really a series of very important photography shows here. Um, well, I one, mean, one the of museum, them museums are responsible, and, and Karen, uh, mm -hmm. but you know, I was. Always, uh, you know, we would sit down and brainstorm a lot about yeah, but, what are we going to do next time. But I do think this was kind of your brainchild, yeah. wasn't it? This, well, this, this show, yeah, I Walk think to Weston. say what are we going to do here, to say uh, if we're going to do a show, we'd better do something that's meaningful. So we thought about it, and, and one thing is okay, let's let's do a show on something that's never been done: California history of California photography, the first hundred years, and. Uh, and we, we picked 101 because that was the most, you know, it was very convenient. And, um, and so we, uh, we got three curators, three guest curators to come in, write the book. And we put the show on and it traveled up and down the state uh, and, very, and seemed to be very successful. But it, what it did, it reestablished the museum as being a place where this kind of work, good, uh, serious, curatorial work and, and uh, product would come out of this museum, which is the whole point. You know, one thing I know, Savi, you, you, you have some of the great uh, male, male photographers. You had Col Colton Watkins and Weston, um, Man Ray, mm -hmm. but also quite a few of the great women photographers yes. like Ann Brigman, yes. Imogene Cunningham, um, others. Um, would, would this may have been one of the first shows to uh, showcase with women? Well, I think the, the, the important thing about California photography was that at the, from about 1900 to 1920, uh, you know, the women were more successful than the men. It may be one of the few times in art history where the women practitioners were more successful than the male practitioners. It was kind of a unique time in art history. So we did emphasize that in the show. Um, the, um, and this one here, Annie Brinkman, uh, she was a, a, a sort of a, a pioneer type person, loved to go camping and that. So she took her sister here, Elizabeth, up to the mountains uh, in the Sierras and around June, when everything's, you know, the final thaw's coming, and they're underneath a uh, glacier here, which is dripping ice water, and she's in an ice water pool and uh, launching this. Uh, this uh, so this is the symbol of uh, rebirth and, uh, and, the, and the way this zygot would go from up here, from the womb, if you like, all the way through life down to the ocean as the kind of symbolism of it. So it's very much in keeping with symbolism and, the, and that kind of, those kind of movements that were part of the pictorial movements in 1900. And so it's very characteristic, but she went out, she went out, did it for real. And uh, back east people didn't even believe this was possible. They thought it was things like this would be done in a photographic studio, but it wasn't. 
Ama amazing. Uh, and Horace <laughs> Bristol here, he was a great character. He w was, um, uh, during the Second World War, he was a, a, a combat photographer in the Navy out in the Pacific. He ended up settling in Japan, marrying a Japanese woman and coming back to America here and lived in Ojai. So when I met him, and, and uh, uh, he was uh, up in Ojai and had his archive there, and we were uh, lucky enough to uh, actually uh, get things directly from him. And, um, and as you see him during his um, final years, uh, he was a great character. I think we have one more photo from the yeah. wonderful photo from that exhibition. Yeah. Again, John Gutman, German photographer, came to San Francisco, and this is the sort of surrealistic movement. This is part of the California version of surrealism, and, and John Gutman was, a, of course, a major figure here in, in uh, California, even though he came originally from Germany. Well, and, and then after this show, uh, the museum is fortunate enough, you two were generous enough to lend a number of your photographs for a kind of series of shows, which I sort of think is like a travel log through time. Yeah. Uh, you had back in 94, there was an exhibition of your photographs of Egypt. Um, then in 1997, there was this show, uh, your photographs of, of Palestine and Jerusalem. and and, and these are pretty rare yeah. photographs, aren't they? It, yeah, I, I've only seen a couple of copies of it in the whole time. It's a fascinating survey. These are military surveys, that, uh, and Sergeant McDonald, it's w one of those classic cases where a fellow is a technician who, ri who really becomes the, the best photographer in the British Army, but uh, you know, comes from a working class environment and not an officer, so he stays a master sergeant in the British Army. But I think he did ultimately retire with a commission, but I'm not certain of that. But, um, but his, he has this keen eye and this high quality, and it was wonderful to see Jerusalem and the Holy Land, both, uh, both of the surveys he did, and see what, what he did with it. Um, the, um, the, I could help the museum by lending the bulk of, uh, of whatever they needed, you know, to sort of stimulate a show. But it was, a lot was borrowed in and a lot was acquired for the museum. For the, it was a way of building the collection and also, you know, covering uh, major parts of art history. Mm -hmm. That's what these shows were meant to achieve. Yeah, and then after this, there was a show of Felice Beato's Photographs of China. Those were those were your photographs. Okay? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And and um, so I think one of the things that you, a camera a camera can be many things, but I think also it's it's a tool for exploration, and you see it here, and then you see it also in a really. Let me see if there we go. A really remarkable show um, that you were involved with here in two thousand four. Yeah. Can so you talk a little bit about the show yeah, and the this, premise? This was, um, um, this was done with Kathleen Howe at, uh, as the curator. And um, uh, she, by this time, moved from Albuquerque to Pomona College as the uh, head of the uh, gallery there. And, and, uh, and uh, of course, Karen was involved, Karen Sinsheimer, and, uh, and some other pieces. And we went and... Uh, I, uh, we acquired and borrowed things that were, where the conceit here was this is the first time the people in the pictures had seen a camera or had been photographed by a camera. So that's what the first scene uh, or title means. Um, and here, over here, is one of these uh, hopper pictures of these holy men who were uh, uh, quite scary and bizarre. They were like, you know, um, witches, really. But uh, a whole portfolio, you know, a whole book full of them, and we put those up on the wall. And and over here, during the uh, what they call the Indian Mutiny, now known as the Revolt, um, was um, um, in um, about 1850. 
55, 56, 57 in India. Um, the, um, uh, the, uh, the troops had revolted, but the, the people with the, with the, um, the uh, Shah and, of, and, the, and the people the, wanted to support the British. So what they did is they would put together groups of, uh, of a horse, they call them, which is cal light cavalry. And the, they'd have my, maybe three or 400 uh, light cavalry Sikh and, and um, Indian uh, riders, and they'd have two officers. They'd have an, uh, and they, they were called different things. And this one here is Hodson's horse. So Hodson um, was a fellow who was, um, he had a, a problem with his accounting and he was under some scr scrutiny. And when, they, <laughs> when things came along, he decided he had to uh, re re you know, recapture his uh, mojo. And he wanted to, uh, so he put together one of these um, horses. And, um, and he went around and was very successful and died in the last days of the campaign when he charged the house and was shot going through the door. And so he died with honor and, and that. And this picture here, to me, represents such a, a, such a historical record of how the British and the Raj people worked together in India to kind of keep control of the place. And, and the, uh, and all, but a psycho, personal psychological one, because um, Hodson is the guy seated down here at the bottom, and uh, his, uh, his lieutenant looks like the very you know, cocky kind of young, kind of brisk English person. And, it's, and it, it gives you the, really an attitude, the attitudes of the characters in this are, is such a wonderful psychological portrait. I think it's one of the greatest pictures of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. Well, it, not only were uh, mm -hmm. the first time these people saw a camera, but when these images went back to England, I'm sure that the people there, it's the first time they were seeing some of these people, these ethnic groups, as they actually lived and as they actually looked and their personalities, um, which also must have been a revelation because uh, what they had seen heretofore in artwork and paintings and sculptures, the pictures of some of these people were tended to be romanticized or exoticized, if that's a word, or or sometimes eroticized, mm -hmm. so that you know, most images of Middle Eastern women uh, are, are, are of ha harem girls. So this must have been something. And when certainly mm -hmm. a, this picture went back to England and they could see mm -hmm. that this holy man was, looked anything but a submissive uh, uh, servant of the crown, um, <laughs> it, it may, have, may have called a bit of a, caused a bit of a stir. Yeah, there's something about the the way the, the, the reality of a camera that brings home these things a little more than a painting or a drawing would. Um, but um, that's the whole 19th century had that effect. You know, the camera had only been around 15 years and every, all these things were flowing back to London. It, it changed every, it's like, it's probably as, as revolutionary as the printing press was and, 1455. I think this was the next thing that changed our whole perception of the world, the, the camera, the photographs. Well, this, this, that, that was a few years ago, but some of you will remember that uh, the Wilson mm -hmm. Center and Michael were kind enough to let us take this show uh, of Michael's collection of the very early salt prints, some date, date to the 40s, pre-Civil War. And this was a show that actually you had organized for the Tate. The Tate. Tate. This went to, was in the, the Tate Britain. Uh, it was an originated show there. With, I, with, we worked with the Tate curators there to um, create the show. It's all from our collection. And we toured it around uh, where we could. Well, we, we've gotten salt, salted prints and many prints from Michael and, and Jane over the years. So I just wanted to actually show a few of them. Uh, I really want to get to Michael's own photographs pretty, pretty quickly, but, but you can see some of the wonderful things. In some cases, they provided funds for the, this, this wonderful image by Lola Alvarez Bravo, and then um, they gave us this fantastic 
a photograph by the Mexican uh, photographer Manuel Alvarez. Blanco. So this, um, the Bravo, uh, Bravo came and visited us in Topanga, and I had the people from the museum come down and meet him when he was uh, visiting us back, in, I guess, 20 years ago before he died. So it was an opportunity to actually meet him. Great. And gave us this wonderful image of uh, Baitina Modotti. Um, yeah, she was Edward Weston's uh, model and muse and uh, became a wonderful photographer in her own right, but died very uh, young, really, uh, in a taxi drive. At, well, she, re she was over in Europe, came back to Mexico City and died in a taxi. Uh, very. Yeah, it's, tragic. It's, it's, it's just a, s a striking image. Mm -hmm. Here Michael's letting me indulge myself up. <laughs> uh, Karen Sinsheimer bought this with funds that, that Michael provided. This, this, I, I know this is no masterpiece, Michael, but this is one of my favorite photographs <laughs> oh, yeah. in the collection. Yeah, well, it's, you know. Even, it's so wonderful. Even cowboys, you know, like, yeah. like babies, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I think this was a German, German yeah. photographer sort of exploring the West, and he caught this wonderful scene, uh, which is so antithetical to the way we think of cowboys. Um, then in more recent years, uh, Michael and his Family's Foundation uh, helped us acquire these wonderful pictures by Casabier and, and, and Dawson. Mm -hmm. And even more recently by the uh, uh, artist uh, Georgi Kepesh, Hungarian yep. work sort of channeling Man Ray. Mm -hmm. and, and most recently, these are some of the things that uh, uh, Charlie Wiley, our current uh, a curator of photography and new media has acquired. And, and they really still fit in with this, uh, the sort of history we have, and, and Michael's have shows of, of very special places, almost sacred places. So here, a photograph on the left by Dawood Bay, works out of Chicago. Um, this is an image of one of the um, safe houses on the, for slaves on the uh, Underground Railroad. Um, really haunting image. Um, so you can see uh, can Candy and the, and the Gloria Budger family helped on that one too. And this other really extraordinary image by uh, uh, artist on my lay, I think that's how you say. Uh, again, a sort of haunting image of, of Vietnam uh, with their, what had been, uh, which still shows ruins of a war-torn country, but, but uh, more recently seen. Um, so before we get to your photographs, Michael, I just want one more question. Are there any photographs that you really have wanted that you were never able to acquire? Oh, there's always those things. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, it's always the one that got away, you know. You, yeah. It's yeah. usually the one that you, you, you know, you were going to purchase it, and you said, oh, that's too much, and then, then you regretted that for the rest of that forever. Okay. Well, as I said, Mike, Michael is a, is, a, is a really accomplished phot photographer himself, and, and you're getting a sneak preview of a show of his photographs that's going to open tomorrow, tomorrow yeah. at the Rose Gallery at Bergamont uh, Station in Santa Monica. Um, so I'm going to ha actually hand this over to you, Michael, <laughs> so you can advance these yeah. slides All right. and speak of, about them. So uh, for 10 years, I've been, maybe more, I've been making tableau vivant, which is, uh, you know, tableaus, like, uh, you, and uh, photographing them. And um, it's, these are just, you know, I started out as uh, just wanting to try and make these things and see what I could do with them. So after, after a, you know, a fairly slow start, I've got 11 of them down at the uh, uh, Rose Gallery. But... This was um, uh, an approach to the um, uh, Last Supper, and it, it's a triptych taking three moments. And, um, you know, I, I think the, the Last Supper is fairly important, and, it's, uh, it, and whether you're a, a Christian or not or whatever, if you raised in the United States, you know, it's all part of our culture, it's part of our uh, part of the way we, uh, phrases we use, figures of speech, uh, 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 similes and, and things like that. So I, 
Um, I wanted to um, uh, take a look at that from at the Last Supper from the way it might have been had it really happened 2,000 years ago and not the way it's been depicted in art history over the last uh, 1,500 years or more. So, um, so I have um, put up a cast of characters. I added some extra people. Um, Mary Magdalene's up there. Uh, there, um, and the thing about her is that she um, she was re rehabilitated. I know if, those of you familiar with Renaissance paintings think of her as the fallen woman who uh, has been, uh, you know, has, has to be redeemed. But uh, um, in 1969, uh, the Pope said, "Guess what?" Pope Innocent I in 1530, who gave a speech about her, uh, mixed her up with another Mary, Mary of Bethel. And actually, Mary Magdalene was not a fallen woman. She was, in fact, uh, one, a close apostle of Jesus. In fact, she's the apostle to the apostles. And uh, scholars now believe that she was a wealthy widow uh, who um, supported Jesus and went his way, and so was this. So was the other woman uh, there, which is um, uh, the um, uh, Salome. If you remember, there were the three people at the cross: this Mary, Mother, Mary Magdalene, Salome. So I just thought I'd make her rehabilitate her, put her in a nice <laughs> dress, and um, and make her the hostess at the evening. So. Um, and, and now, how did you cast this? You did go to central casting. I uh, did. I went and spent you? a lot of time <laughs> casting people. I wanted to get people who were looked like people who would have lived in uh, Jerusalem 2,000 years ago after 40, four centuries of successive invasions from east and west, all the way from Egypt, uh, Greece, and um, the... Um, and, and uh, the uh, Arab countries to the east, and um, uh, Persia, and all these people mixed, uh, had come through and mixed the, um, up the race. For, uh, and, and here is, uh, they've been living under Roman rule for 72 years. So I put it like the, the Romans would have had a low table and everyone sitting around it, and that would have been the style. And of course, in, this is a, supposed to be a, the upper level of a wealthy household in uh, Jerusalem who, where, where the next day was Passover they were gonna have, so this was the place they were using. So that was the, uh, that's the idea. And here's the, you know, the pouring of the wine. And, uh, and then this moment here is the moment that uh, the, um, you see that uh, uh, Jesus hands uh, Judas the bread. And he said already, in the, the, and everybody sort of had a discussion about who was going to betray him and all that. So uh, anyway, that's what this is about. And you can see there's an ambiguity here because it says uh, in the Bible that uh, the moment he handed him the bread, uh, Satan entered Judas's heart, so it sounds like he was maybe chosen rather than. Anyway, it's a, it's, it's that's one of the things. So, and, and that set was constructed by you. What you did, yeah. That, it wasn't it's constructed in a stage, and that this is instead a chapel. So when I saw, you know, the um, when I read about the Abu Ghraib uh, things that happened in the, with the U.S. Army and the military police in the Abu Ghraib prison in 2004. Um, I was, um, I was, you know, I had been thinking about how to deal with this uh, issue. So I took a, um, I took this, this picture, uh, this picture on the, on the left, um, um, I, I, I was inspired, this one here, I was inspired by this one here, which is the Amane, uh, at the uh, Chicago Art Institute of Chicago, your old place. Yeah. And I thought, well, you know, uh, why not um, associate with religious painting this sort of 
all the mocking and things they did and the torture they did. Uh, let's tie it to something we, we uh, understand and know. So that was the idea behind um, uh, this, you know, the tableau here is a reenactment of the painting in modern time in, with a modern situation uh, that, uh, that people can associate with. And then, of course, this one's the scourging one. Um, another one here is the, you know, the Caravaggio, the calling of St. Matthew, again, the sort of religious painting. I was um, always uh, tempted by that, uh, you know, wanting to somehow reenact this in modern dress. I thought it would be a fascinating um, thing to do, but I couldn't figure out what the situation would be in the modern times. So, um, but here, this, um, uh, this fellow here, which is the same position as St. Matthew. So in the, in the St. Matthew one, Jesus comes along and says, follow me, and he's a tax, he's a tax collector, and he says, oh, well, I'm, I'll go off and, and, uh, and follow Jesus. And he goes off, and he ultimately is martyred. So this fellow here, uh, Henning, uh, Alan Henning, was a taxi driver. So these are the taxi drivers. That's their medallions. And these are, his cricket bat here is what taxi drivers use. In the original, it's a sword. And here, it's a, a taxi drivers use that some to defend themselves in London taxis. So. And so these uh, taxi drivers are, um, uh, you know, he, he sees these people from the uh, Syrian relief, and he decides he's going to follow them. And he follows them off to uh, uh, Turkey and then works for the Syrian relief and then decides to take some things across the border. And uh, you can see him here uh, at, down in uh, Turkey. And what happens is he ultimately gets caught by ISIS and he's beheaded on television by uh, uh, Jihadi John, which was one of the British ISIS people. And so he ended up martyred. So I thought, well, this is a great example. That's a modern example. So, But for your photograph, you managed to find someone who looked quite a bit Well, like I did, him. yeah. It was great. We had someone look kind of like him. Um, and this one here, as uh, um, Velasquez, when he was a young man, he, he worked in, in Spain, and he decided to have his first trip to, uh, to Rome, so he went to Rome and he painted two pictures while he was there. And what, this is one of them, this is in the Prado. And it's the, uh, and this is a, a story from Ovid. So uh, what's happening here is that um, um, uh, Apollo comes and he says, listen, while you're, uh, uh, he says to Vulcan, look, while you're making this suit of armor down here for for Mars, Mars is having it off with Venus, your wife. <laughs> and you can see the look on his face there. So, uh, so I, uh, I thought we'd do this out near the garage near my house in uh, bell size <laughs> and uh, re recreate a similar situation. <laughs> but, but you really saved money on casting. On I did, I saved a lot of money on casting. Whoops, go back. Saved a lot of money on casting because that's my son. <laughs> Uh, this is his best buddy. Uh, this is uh, this ha um, Ella Neff now, Weston Neff's daughter, work is living in, and works for me uh, in the collection, and uh, is my primary printer and uh, for for these pictures. And uh, so she's there, and a couple of other friends, and this is my uh, sister's ward. Uh, and so uh, I, this is, and you can see here Mars is now riding, driving a car. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I guess, uh, is that the end of no, the, yeah, oh no, this A couple one more, a couple more. Oh, we see this. Well, um, this one here is, uh, is one about social situations. You can see these uh, women here are all fairly self-sufficient and very happily uh, engaged in uh, successful pursuits in life as doctor, you know, doctors, lawyers, and uh, accountants, and whatever. 
And uh, this reflects the fact that about 60% of the women for the last 20 years are graduate from college are 60% women and only 40% men. So what happens is as time goes on, uh, you, they end up with uh, maybe when they get to their mid-30s, they decide, what am I, you know, maybe I should have a family or something. And uh, then they look around to see who's available. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's a lot of blue collar guys and they're thinking, nah, I don't know. So anyway, I thought that would be an interesting thing. So this was made, this set was made in UCLA by um, the, um, the students there. And, uh, and they did a fantastic job of creating this set and dressing it. It's so wonderful. I'm, I'm, it, was, it turned out to be an absolutely fantastic thing. And then here is the Rose Gallery itself. Uh, and um, uh, this one here is a content. Uh, we did this last year out here. And the idea was, um, um, was uh, we, you know, the, they had a gallery here that was full of what you might call fluid uh, gender uh, subjects. And uh, I thought would be, I put out a casting call for fluid gender people in, uh, young fluid gender people in uh, LA. And I got all the, a bunch of people and uh, they're all here. And uh, uh, we only have, we have Joanne Callis, who's, that's her paint, paint up there. If you know her, she's shown here at the museum. She's a, a LA uh, artist. She's there trying to talk to the kids about her work. But, um, and then over here, uh, that's Rose from the Rose Gallery. That's Michael Blaskin, who's here tonight. He's a collector. And uh, here is uh, uh, Virginia Heckert, who's uh, a, uh, a curator for the Getty. And they're in here looking at a classical picture, a Carlton Watkins painting, a photograph here. Of, uh, and so there, there's sort of in the back room, the people that are you know, looking at the, the historical, uh, the classic stuff. So, there. so tomorrow when your show opens at yeah. the Rose Gallery. It's the Rose Gallery, it's there. Yeah. We'll, we'll be in that back room, right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I think that's it. Thank you yeah. very much. Well, well, well thank you. Thanks a lot.